Hey mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm sitting at the base of a big old oak tree that has a pretty substantial fruiting of a mushroom that people call the veiled oyster mushroom. The scientific name is Pleurotus levis, and there is also a similar species called Pleurotus dryenus. But uh, this is not very much like a sort of classic oyster mushroom in a lot of respects. And uh, certainly by this point in time, these mushrooms are, you know, not fit to be eaten by humans. Uh, uh, because they are incredibly tough. Like if you listen to me handling this, it's more sounds like cracking paper mache than a mushroom. Also, uh, the veiled oyster mushroom has a big chonky stem. That's what helps you, you know, tell this apart from other oyster mushrooms because most oyster mushrooms have a rudimentary or, you know, basically very, very difficult to observe stem. But these guys have nice, you know, long chonky stems. But also uh, they take on this really unusual sort of uh, wool sock furriness on the top of the cap and also on this uh, big and very, very tough stem. And so, you know, even um, these mushrooms when they're younger and people are interested in eating them, I tend to be like, if it has any hairs whatsoever, I am not interested because I'm very sensitive to things like, um, well, chewing on wool socks is what it reminds me of. So anyway, I wanted to highlight that, not just because I'm sitting underneath a tree with all of these mushrooms on them, but, uh, you know, and if you see this uh, sort of phenomenon, definitely take a look because it is interesting to observe uh, um, an oyster mushroom that has sort of the remnants of a veil, but, and it, you know, the common name veiled oyster mushroom comes from the fact that uh, Pleurotus levis can have a veil, but it's usually like really uh, just a little bit of a vague uh, suggestion of a ring on the stem. But uh, I wanted to talk about uh, inedible mushrooms and just observing mushrooms in general, because my last video, I almost was like, my gosh, I just talked about foraging the whole time. And I love that, but you know, we're now about 10 days out from a rain. There aren't a lot of mushroom, like if I wanted to forage for dinner, I'd have to cover a lot of territory. And so my uh, focus has shifted substantially to, uh, you know, learning to identify mushrooms a little bit better, even though, uh, you know, they're not mushrooms that I want to consume. So when times are tight and there aren't a lot of mushrooms in our uh, sort of summer and fall season in North Carolina, I can almost always rely on finding some big stinky Amanita mushrooms. And uh, I think you will find uh, the same to be the case. So I'm holding two of them right here. This is, I'm going to provisionally identify as Amanita ropalopus, which I think is just a glorious uh, scientific name. I love to say the word ropalopus. And uh, the common name for it is the club-footed American Lepidella. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But anyway, you know, we have several species of these really large sort of cream-colored mushrooms that uh, tend to be sort of warty on the top to one degree or another. They also have big bulbous bases. And so, let's see, I have another mushroom here with me. This is um, actually a Caesar mushroom. And so this is also an Amanita mushroom. And it has a big old cup of tissue at the base. And so if you're learning about the Amanita genus, a lot of what you're going to learn is like focuses around cups of tissue at the base because very dangerous and very desirable edible Amanitas oftentimes have those features. But in the case of a lot of Amanitas, you don't have a cup. You have more of a bulb or a foot. And so that's the case with these, uh, you know, different um, mushrooms. This one, again, Amanita ropalopus. And then the other two that you will see, and I'll talk a little bit more about, are Amanita dausipes, also known as carrot foot, and Amanita ravenelli, which is known as ravenel's Amanita. And so, uh, you know, they are very um, large mushrooms. They tend to flourish longer and don't get eaten by bugs nearly as rapidly as other Amanita mushrooms. And they stink to high heaven. Like I'm holding them and I'm smiling, but that's only because I prepared myself mentally for holding these mushrooms and smiling while doing so for uh, more than a minute or two. But anyway, uh, you know, these are just striking mushrooms to find and photograph for a lot of reasons they have really dramatic features. So let's talk about them. Uh, so, oh gosh, and, I, and then I had, to, I had to scratch near my eye and now I have this lovely aroma. So let's start with the aromas of these mushrooms and also their taxonomic classification. 
So uh, the mushroom that this most likely is, is Amanita ropalopus. My second choice for identification is Amanita ravenelli. And those two mushrooms, again, are these large uh, sort of creamy colored uh, dealies. They have really large rings on the stem, creamy colored gills, a bulbous base, and then also uh, warty caps. And in the case of um, <clears throat> both of these mushrooms they also have a really strong sort of chlorine aroma and there's also a bit of like rotting protein aroma and the best analog i can create in my mind is it smells like a peed in pool so it's a very very strong aroma they uh i also wonder like a lot of mushrooms even ones that smell quite repulsive are oftentimes very popular with bugs but these mushrooms don't tend to attract a lot of uh insects except for um you know beetles that will use the uh the gills as sort of like condominium space but as far as them being like this uh you know magnet for wildlife to eat amanita ropalopus and amanita ravenelli not really on the top of anybody's list as far as far as edibility for humans, they are classified as likely toxic, edibility unknown, presumed to be dangerous, and, you know, with good reason. That even if we were in the era where, you know, every mushroom that we suspected was new, someone was willing to raise their hand and taste test it to see if we can add it to our list of edible species, we would have to have really committed volunteers to be interested in these mushrooms because that very strong chlorine smell is really, uh, it's, it's, it's a killer. And um, so the uh, thing that distinguishes between, and, and this is stuff I'm learning still, but the thing that distinguishes Amanita ropalopus from Amanita ravenelli is the way that these warts manifest themselves. So I'm gonna show you another specimen that I believe to be Amanita ravenelli. So, uh, and this will also give you a sense of the life cycle and appearance of these mushrooms. So this is a fully mature one, and it's a small fully mature uh, mushroom of this type. So sometimes their you know, caps can be almost the size of dinner plates, but when they are uh, you know, still growing, you have this big enlarged chunky base and then uh, basically the cap is this little chunk on top. And Amanita ravenelli, besides Ravenel's Amanita, I guess some people call it the pinecone Amanita because it has this sort of like pinecone-y looking top to it. Uh, so anyway, the uh, thing that distinguishes um, Ropalopus and Ravenelli is in the warts. So what I'm going to do here is point to you uh, really quickly. You can see that these warts, they can come off pretty easily. So, you know, they do flake off. But in the case of uh, Amanita Ravenelli, they're basically, they rest on an interlocking and radially arranged uh, pattern of flesh that's sort of underneath each of these little warts. And so given what this looks like and with these sort of, you can see little outlines, I suspect that this is Amanita ravenelli. And by contrast, if you look at this dude, they are, you know, uh, the warts are nicely like radially uh, arranged, but they're not resting on anything. And, uh, and, you know, I looked at a lot of different observations online to do a good comparison, and I'm definitely on the fence because this is, you know, not new territory to me because I've been encountering these mushrooms for a really long time and just saying, ew, it's a gross lepidella and leaving it there. Uh, but, you know, my interest in uh, the difference between the two has grown. So anyway, it is one of the two of those. I, of course, also am like, I would like to endorse it being Amanita ropalopus because I want to say Amanita ropalopus at least five more times today. Uh, I will talk very briefly about Amanita dausipes. So um, that, uh, again, common name is carrot foot. It shares all of these uh, features with the, the mushrooms, you know, ropalopus and ravenelli. It tends also to have uh, like a lot of these um, splits and whatnot that you can see on the base of this bulb. And those splits oftentimes get sort of a, a um, orangey flush. So sort of a carrot color, hence carrot foot mushroom. Uh, but Amanita, um, oh, I'm sorry. There was a, there was an attractive cyclist that just went by and I was, I was looking at his posterior. It was very nice. Okay. So back to Amanita dausipes. So it has all of these same features that I was discussing, uh, and then a little bit more in the way of orange staining. And I say a little bit more because both, um, 
Amanita ravenelli and Ropalopis ravenelli in particular, I think can get orange. But anyway, uh, Amanita dausipes has a smell that's much more like uh, on the, the protein side or meaty side, as opposed to the chlorine side. So it does still smell uh, sort of putrid and like um, dried out. I, I liken it to a ham sandwich that's been sitting in the sun for several hours unattended. So anyway, um, you know, these mushrooms are all classified um, in a kind of persnickety way taxonomically. So if you're interested in learning more about them, my best recommendation is to uh, start visiting amanitaceae.org. So there is uh, a world-renowned uh, Amanita expert, Rod Tullus, who uh, sort of does an amazing job of cataloging and publishing the information about emerging taxonomic changes and different species within the Amanita genus. And so if you're interested in going like really deep into Amanita, that is the direction to go and following Rod Tullis's work is really instrumental if you wanna become a famous Amanitologist yourself one day. Uh, but you know, the thing that's really um, noteworthy is that in most guidebooks you would find uh, this uh, mushroom classified or sort of commonly referred to as a lepidella. And um, so as I've discussed on the channel before, the Amanita genus is quite large. It's very, um, you know, well studied, a lot of beautiful mushrooms, and it's split up into different sections. And so that's helpful for sort of clumping different groups of species together. And there is a section called Lepidella, and that contains a lot of these big stinky fellows that are uh, sort of a, you know, um, beige color, and they have these big, uh, you know, elaborate uh, rings on their stems and skirts and so forth. And lumpy, bumpy bases, but it turns out that uh, Amanita ravenelli, Amanita dausipes, Amanita ropalopis are probably uh, am in a different section that's being spun up called Amanita roanokensis. Now that information is still like being formed up and in flux, and so like I can't speak to it with any degree of real uh, deep certainty. Um, and then additionally, it's just important to note that this is one of those, I think, inflection points for me around learning common names and how much value I give to them. So I really like mushroom common names, you know, for a lot of reasons, but I use the scientific names for my own learning because categorization makes learning faster. So I'm just like, when I'm learning the scientific names, I'm just building a scaffold of like who's related to who, and I can start to plug things in. And it, it is quite a yarn wall in my case, because I'm not a systematic mycologist, but nonetheless, like those scientific names signify more information than just what a specific specific organism is, is. That said, I love the common names and oftentimes it's really helpful, you know, not just for teaching and learning, but just like observing stuff. And you just all the Latin and Greek can get quite, quite daunting and fill your brain up after a while. However, because there are so many mushrooms that are understudied or the only people who would ever really care to look at them are mycologist types anyway, we end up with common names that are actually just sort of an Americanized version of the scientific name. So, perfect example, Amanita ropalopis, its common name is the club-footed American lepidella, after the lepidella section of the Amanita genus that it used to be in. However, now it is moving over to Roanokensis. And so will this be the, uh, you know, will we change this to the club-footed uh, Roanoke uh, mushroom? Perhaps. It's really hard to say. Um, and so, you know, I think this really hit home. I was at the North, Ala uh, North American Mycological Association foray, gosh, several weeks ago, a month and a half at this point. Anyway, it was a blast, but one of the things almost immediately I started to look at um, different collections on the tables, and I was like, oh, okay, here is um, something that is uh, called Tapanella, and the common name of it is Poison Pax, because it used to be Paxillus was the, you know, scientific name for the genus. And so now we have a mushroom that the common name is a reference to a genus that is no longer accurate for that mushroom. And if you wanna talk about ways that common names can get confusing, that might be the most egregious area of like, we're, get, we're moving towards specificity because there's only so many people who are interested in these organisms, 
But in doing that and creating common names, we're also setting ourselves up. So I guess the long and short is I really enjoy common names and I'm a really big fan of efforts to uh, create more systematic common names that we can share and use. I would say that any common name that is based on any kind of genus name or even like family or order, heck, well, let's just go all the way up to phylum while we're at it. Maybe let's not use the uh, scientific names of something to create a common name. And I say that as though I'm scolding somebody. I'm not. I just uh, am, I think that puts me in a place where if I see uh, a common name that is, uh, you know, a, a string or a, a segment of a, of a scientific name and I, I look at it and I'm like, okay, I, this is definitely one of those situations where I'm just gonna dial in the scientific name and uh, keep up with it as I can. Of course, as with all of these things, you know, mushrooms are just changing constantly in terms of their classification, but that doesn't change the fact that like, when it's been dry and you're out in the woods and you're just interested in seeing what's um, you know, responsive to the specific weather conditions. Observing big stinky mushrooms is one of my favorite things to do um, because they're just so preposterous and they just like take up so much space, like visually, olfactorily, in every other respect. Amanita ropolopus, Amanita ravenelli, Amanita dalcipes. I love you all, uh, whether or not you are uh, Roanokensis or Lepidellas, it doesn't matter to me. Um, as far as other things I want to talk to you about, I'm going to try to sign off real quick here, but I did want to show you a feature really quick um, of uh, this uh, lactarius mushroom, or it could be lactifluous, but anyway, it's a milky cap mushroom, and I don't know what it is. Milky caps are defined by uh, having a latex or a juice that uh, bleeds out of the gills when you damage them, so that's the case with this fella. But what I wanted to highlight is this feature that is just so uh nifty to me and it's called scrobiculi so it's these little potholes or little pits now let me see if i can get a slightly there we go slightly better focus on them here so they're just basically these little uh pits on the uh, stems of a lot of uh, lactarius mushrooms in particular and they're really neat and like if you get your hand lens up on them they're kind of gooey around the edges but i love the sort of texturization that it creates because a lot of times you have you know these milky mushrooms and they're uh they have like really neat concentric growth zones on the cap and then you flip them over and you have oh my goodness there are so many scrobiculi and to my point about semantics and mushroom words, scrobiculus is one of those things like A plus, can't get enough of it. So if we ever find a way to um, use the Latin epithet ropa lopis on a mushroom with scrobiculi, I would be delighted. So I could say this is lactarius ropa lopis with exquisite scrobiculi. I think that might be a tall order for our uh, mycological community, but nonetheless, I put it in my order. That's what I want to see y'all focus on. Um, for the rest of you, I hope you have a wonderful week. Let's talk again soon and find as many mushrooms as you possibly can.